Thank you all for being here. Okay, so lesson one again, we're gonna go over the resume. Lesson two, we're gonna talk about applicant tracking systems. Lesson three, we're gonna put everything together. Lesson four, we're gonna talk about job searching, LinkedIn, networking, and interviewing. Okay. Now first, let's go into lesson one, the resume. And this applies again, for 2021 and beyond, what the current standards are, what we're looking at now coming into the employment landscape. There's three types of resumes to choose from. The first one is a chronological resume. This is the most common resume format. This essentially focuses on our work experience. This is gonna provide details to companies you've worked for and the length of employment you've had at each job. It starts with the most recent work or employment and works backwards. The chronological resume, as you can see on the screen here, is best for job seekers with a solid work history, meaning no gaps in work history. Everything is fluid. Um, and it's also really good for applicant tracking system scans. Some pros is it's a, the format uh, that hiring managers and recruiters are most familiar with and want. Some cons is that it can show employment gaps. So the reason why I'm telling you this and the reason why I'm going into chronological first is I want to address possibly each individual's employment situation. Some of you may have solid work history. Some of you may have some gaps. Some of you may have a combination thereof. So we have different formats to utilize to address this, to maximize our chances moving forward employment-wise. Okay. So note on this chronological resume, a lot of us have seen, this, have seen this. And like I said, it's the most common format. It's, but here's a little note on that. Let's make the chronological resume stand out by featuring achievements in our work history sec, uh, section that are gonna relate directly to the job we're seeking. So a lot of times now when we're applying for work, whatever position we're applying for, more times often than not, the hiring recruiter or the hiring manager is going to be looking at your past work history. And usually they want to see that last position you have line up with what you're going for, have some sort of relation in the trajectory of where you're going. Um, now, sometimes we won't have that. Sometimes we'll have to address it and wordsmith and figure out how to, how to do that. But this is, this, this, is a, this is a great resume for that. Now, and then showing achievements in that work history is also pivotal. Using action verbs and numbers to describe the accomplishment. So something like this, instituted new processes that contributed to 20% increases in efficiency. You can elaborate on that more, but you get the general idea of we're giving more context to what we've done. We're making it stand out. We're making them look at us as an individual instead of just a regular boilerplate resume they get. Now, moving on from the chronological, we've got the functional. Now the functional is very similar. Uh, the only thing about it is that this particular resume focuses more so on skills. Why would it focus more on skills? Well, let's say if we have some gaps in employment, let's say we're trying to change careers. Overall, this will place the skills center page. And this resume is really good for those types of job seekers. Those who have, like I said, the gaps in employment, those who are maybe changing industry. It's a great resume because it showcases all the skills you have. We can put skills on there that will directly relate to the job we're applying for and so forth. So it's got, it's got a few pros. It also has some cons. The emphasis on skills rather than work history can make the resume sometimes look inexperienced. Now, these are all things to consider, and I'm giving you all odds and ends of these different pieces of each individual resume. Depending on what you use, um, everything will have the same, the same type of layout, but we're gonna get into that. The next type is a combination or hybrid resume. So overall, this resume is gonna combine a functional and a chronological format. It'll highlight skills and it'll highlight work history. We're now seeing this more so than the other two. This one is, is really what it's all about now because this one 
is easy to, to use with applicant tracking systems. We'll get into why that's important later in lesson two, but this particular resume focuses, it's a best of both worlds approach. Uh, this is also great for those with a diverse employment history. You can use this for making career changes. You can use this if you have transferable skills to the job you're applying for, et cetera. So here's a little note on this. The combination resume highlights how you've excelled by pointing out specific accomplishments in your work history that utilized your key abilities. It also presents transferable skills that would prove useful across different jobs or career fields. Now here again is the three different types of resumes. Doesn't Now you can choose each one depending on your situation. Now there's three types, one format. As you can see here, everything's got a name. Everything has um, a heading on there. Now in that heading, we've got, like I said, a name, we've got a phone number, we've got an email, we've got our LinkedIn profile link in there as well, which is very, very important. And if, you know, cab, uh, side note here, if LinkedIn is something uh, you want to build upon, you want to know a little bit more about, definitely sign up for my Zooms because we're going to go into that. I'll show you how I've grown my network. It's It's been crazy, um, but I've grown it to the point where I can get people um, in different industries, I can talk to them on a daily basis and figure out what's going on and bring information back to you. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. And it's also really good for job seekers because um, I'll show you how to find people to bring into your network. So make sure we have that on our resume. Now, after the heading, each, each resume, no matter what, we're, what format we're choosing, I want you all to label it with a title depending on what job you're applying to. So if I'm applying to a project manager in IT, I'm gonna have the heading, doesn't matter, chronological, functional, or a combination, have the heading and right below that, I'm gonna put the title of the job I'm applying to. We do that because no resume going forward can ever be the same. We can't use the same one anymore for the same job. We have to start tailoring our resumes to job postings. As competition rises, the reliance on applicant tracking systems go up because more people are applying for work and the machines are sifting through these people, finding those who match the job posting most uh, directly. So putting that resume title, that's, that's an easy point for applicant tracking systems because they've been optimized to find that in your resume. We'll get more into that in lesson two. So from that title, we're gonna go down and everybody should have a professional summary. Now, this is what JobScan defines a professional summary as. It's a well-written, um, basically customized for the job you're applying for. It adds value to your resume that sets it apart from other applicants. How we do that is, in other words, it's not just a generic cry to hire you. It's a, it's a very specific, very targeted way of pointing to hiring managers and saying, hey, why waste your time with these other people when what you're looking for is right here? It's a, it's a quick summary of where you've been so far in your career. Also, where you want to go with the company you're, you're currently applying to. It wraps all that up. We're also taking things from the job posting. We can wrap that in there too, and I'll show you how to do that as we go. Then we're going to go into the skills section as you're looking at these different types of resumes. People, or excuse me, the formats have the skills in different places. No matter which format you, excuse me, resume you use, you're gonna have two types of skills. The first type is a hard skill. Now this is a measurable ability. So this can be anything from program creation, uh, business development, et cetera. Then you've got soft skills. Now these are personal skills. These are critical thinking, personal traits, uh, leadership, management, communication, things like that. It'll be a combination of both. A lot of that's gonna come from the job posting, what the company's looking for. We're gonna go down and talk about the work history in these different resumes as well. Now in work history, <clears throat> here's what we need to start thinking about. Because this is the reality of it. When, when everybody's applying for work, a lot don't necessarily tailor their resume to the job posting. A lot don't really emphasize the impact they had in each of their roles. And this is something we really need to start doing now 
because like I said, competition is getting uh, through the roof. Me, uh, uh, one reason being is because employers aren't necessarily limited to state lines anymore. People are being hired all over the country remote wise. We're figuring out we can do a lot on the internet, uh, through the internet and online through online means. So people are not limited. Um, so here's what we wanna do to add a little bit more impact is we wanna include intriguing job responsibilities. It's a fact that some tasks are so mundane that they're easily assumed from your job title. If you were a cashier, you obviously operated the cash register. So there's no really need, no need to really detail this so much in this work history part. Instead, list tasks the hiring manager's unlikely to know about, such as taking the initiative to reorganize counter displays to better highlight the impulse purchases that are most common in that particular locale. Things like that. What did you do outside of the box in that particular role? Now, further, what we want to do is add a little more impact with that by adding some numbers, if we can, quantifying some things, increase the impact with maybe even, like I was saying earlier, increase X production by implementing such a system. Now, we can also add powerful adjectives, innovative, rousing, devoted diplomatic, things like that. As I was saying about quantifying your results, we don't necessarily have to be in a numbers or dollars oriented role for this. Simply, did we lead people? Uh, if so, how many? Did we create processes that led to either increases, maybe decreases in production? Did we save materials or time? Did we produce X amount of things in a certain amount of time? You see where I'm going with this. This adds a little bit more impact to the roles we have. Now, in, these, in the employment section, it's going to have four crucial elements always need to be there. The company you work for, the name of it, the location, the title you had, and the date. And the date has to be two month, four year. That's how it is. You, we can't just go with years and we can't, um, we can't do any other type of format because applicant tracking systems are a little finicky with that. And employers want to see um, some, some transparency with, with uh, dates. Okay, lastly, there's these last two sections. I'll hit these briefly as we move on. Um, education. Now in this section, moving forward, degree, certification, license, this has to be on there, the type, the institution where you got it. Now the location is not necessary anymore. Um, according to many different uh, sources that I use, job scan, resume worded, uh, all these different resources, the, uh, the location for that is not a, not a thing. Uh, people really aren't too worried about that. Um, now, if you're currently working on something, let's say you're working on a degree or a certification, I would always encourage you to add that. Tell them you're working on it by saying something like um, the, the type of degree, expected graduation, plus the year. Um, this or to be completed plus the year. This shows you're vested into your education for that said role, especially if that education you're getting is related to that job. They're going to want to know. Uh, and I've seen it work uh, more times than not as far as being a, in a positive direction. So lastly, awards. On awards, let's include significant awards only. And let's quantify those accomplishments. Why do I want to do this is because, again, we want to cut through competition. By adding significance and by quantifying that, we add more value, kind of like the work history. We want to include the award title, recognition level, and the date and the purpose. Let me give you an example. Awarded the 2019 Arizona Department of Labor Performance Award for creating systems that led to an 80% increase in connecting military families to employment, training, and supportive resources. That shows more emphasis than if I just would have put something like Department of Labor Performance Award. That would have left a lot of, of, of room out there to kind of wonder what it was about. So by putting a little bit more emphasis, it shows more impact. That's the theme with this. Okay. I mentioned it briefly as we're going through here. No matter what we're using, chronological, functional, a combination, we always, always want to target that resume to the job we're applying for. Okay, 
So let's talk about this a little bit. What does it mean? So we take the basic resume and we create a target resume. Always have a master copy of your resume, the basic resume. It'll have everything on there. But no, that is your, that is your starting place. That's your raw materials you're going to work with to then create. You can duplicate it and then create it, another one for a specific job called a targeted resume. Balanced Careers defines a targeted resume as being a document that focuses on specific job openings written to highlight the skills and experiences relevant to a particular position. When sending targeted resumes, the resume will be edited or rewritten for each job to which the candidate applies. That is the formal definition of what a targeted resume is from Balanced Careers. Regardless of what format we're gonna choose, as I mentioned, we, the resume needs to comply and incorporate elements from the job posting. Moving forward, once the format is chosen, we then need to structure it um, and, and start thinking of it in ways like, for instance, our resume is going, to, it is always from now moving forward is a laser focused product that's built to the exact specifications listed within a job posting. I keep looking over here because I'm imagining the job postings here, but that's exactly what it is. We are creating something to order every time. It doesn't have to be a massive overhaul every time, but it has to be curated every time. There is no exceptions because we won't pass applicant tracking systems. We will continue to get the thank you, but no thank you rejection unless we have some connections. We'll get into that later or networking. We'll get into that later. So that's a quick overview. And I know, I know it's a lot of information. I know if, you, if you're not familiar with any resumes, this is probably a lot of information. But look, as I've mentioned, we can sit down in, in Zooms together because I want to make sure you understand this because I want to see you get an interview and get that meaningful employment. Really, that's truly what I want. And, and we can sit down and we can work together on that. So let's move into um, some fonts. This is kind of a funny segue, a little bit of a breather um, <laughs> from everything else that we've been talking about. But here's an interesting thing that happened. They did a study and they took a bunch of recruiters and whose they is whoever made this. They took a bunch of recruiters and they gave them all a different resume. And it was all static. So it was all the same information on each resume, but the font was different. And what they were trying to find out is whose attention was held the longest, depending on what font they were looking at. And Helvetica always came through. So I use Helvetica. Talk about a cell, right? Helvetica. So that's a really good font to use. It's modernized. Funny little thing is Times New Roman, we Times and Room is a default on, on Word or any documents we usually use or even Arial. And uh, uh, Balance Careers, even a bunch of different uh, people, when they go out and they interview uh, interviewers or hiring managers, they said Times New Roman on a resume in terms of font is the equivalent of walking into an interview with sweatpants on. It's pretty crazy. People take it seriously. So I'm telling you, Helvetica, I promise. All right. Okay, so let's take a breather just for a second. And uh, we're gonna get into lesson two. So with that information, with knowing resumes, knowing there's three different types of resumes, one format that it all adheres to, it all needs to have basic information, knowing we have to target that resume to job postings, let's talk about why we have to do all this. What is the reason we're doing this? Here it is, folks. This is a perfect illustration. It's kind of comical, but because uh, it's got a bunch of people going through a funnel and then, they're, uh, and then they're getting processed out and then they're going through applicant tracking systems and they're being kicked out, swipe right or swipe left, right? That's exactly what's happening. And so uh, applicant tracking systems are just, are, are, are something that we have to just get used to and we have to know how to beat them. So here's some things to know about applicant tracking system. Um, Basically, 98% of Fortune 500 companies and at least 66% of large companies use these. The adoption rate for small companies is lower, but growing quickly. So last year, it was estimated that 35% of small organizations use ATS. That's now increasing uh, as predicted. Now, 
Here's the other thing about this. Applicant tracking systems are essentially here to make it easier for the employer, the hiring manager, the recruiter to find the right candidate. There's very various different systems they use, but they all operate the same way. Essentially, we apply to, apply to jobs and we go through a machine and it judges our resume with complete impartiality, doesn't care about anything else, but what it's been programmed to find. The recruiter, whoever creates the job posting, whoever runs the applicant tracking system is programming it to find certain things because that's what they need for that job. So we have to put that information in our resume because these systems aren't going away. Now, applicant tracking systems in conjunction with being very, um, in terms of easy for employers to use, to sift through candidates, they're also making things um, excellent by having data and analytics available on the back end, um, keeping track of all the candidates that come through the system, having them go through a generalized process, legality wise. They've also incorporated uh, new texting as far as recruitment. So applicant tracking systems, what I'm selling right now is it's not going away. And because we find ourselves in such a unique climate in terms of employment, meaning people are applying all over the place, they're not limited to, to just state lines anymore, these things are being used all the time. So we have to know how to beat them and how to beat them is to target a resume to the job posting. Okay. Now let's look at a couple of things about these. Talio is the most used one. Why am I telling you this? Because everything that I'm talking about is based on Talio, Workday, these systems. So every, everything I'm going to show you from this point forward on how to beat these systems has been vetted through job scan and works. So let me get into this. Lesson three, let's put it all together. Um, all right, it's dry. I apologize, guys. Um, okay, so we'd seen, we talked briefly about resumes. I talked really briefly about applicant tracking systems. And the reason is, is because it's simple to understand that a machine is, is out there doing its thing. Now that we know that, let's reverse engineer it and beat it. So, but before we do that, we need a couple of things. Um, here's what we need. Usually, when I always apply to work, when I'm getting down to apply for a job, I have a digital notepad up, I've got my digital basic resume, and I've got the internet browser. And that's all we need. And we will we'll hit the mark. So let's talk about the setup. Once I have these three tools, let's move into a hypothetical situation. I kind of mentioned it earlier. Let's say I find a job as an IT manager, a project manager in IT for the state of Arizona. And let's look at that job posting. Here's the job posting. It's nothing too crazy. It's pretty basic. It's what we usually would see in a job posting. It's got the job description, knowledge, skills, and abilities, and special selection factors. That's what we're going to pay attention to. We're going to, we're going to go through here and look at this. Now I have a process with this. When I'm looking at this job posting, I've got three phases that I go through. The first one is called mining. So what is it? Mining, this is the process of analyzing the job posting, highlighting the keywords, skills and experience found within it, taking that and putting it on my digital notepad. And that is, basically the raw material we're going to be working with. So let's look at the job posting one more time and then let's mine the job posting. So I've got it mined. And this is the information that sticks out. This is what the employer is looking for. And I've ran this through applicant tracking system already to make sure that I've, I've hit everything. But beforehand, this was it and I hit it. You, basically they have a threshold. 80% or higher is where you wanna go. You want to get as much as this information on your resume. A lot of this is a game. It is a game. All of it is. So once I have this information, once I go through the job description, the knowledge, the skills and abilities, the, the special selection, because they're looking for some certifications here, I'm going to put that on that digital notepad. And it's going to look like this. I recommend cleaning it up a little bit. So what I did, I put all the block of information on there. I put it all in its own little line. And then I just bulleted it out. And that's easy for me to then to move into my resume where I need it to go. 
And let me address this too, because sometimes this is the elephant in the room. A lot of, sometimes people will say this is like plagiarizing, a job posting. It's not in an academic setting, so it's not plagiarizing. So it's, it's not the right definition to use or not the right uh, classification to use first off. Secondly, it's not because let me pose a question to you. If you have, if you have to beat a machine that has essentially been programmed to find X words, X amount of words in your resume in order for you to secure an interview, how are you going to do it other than taking those exact keywords that are in the job posting to put them in your resume? There really is no other way. We have to do that. So there's an ethical check. We do. I'm not going to willy nilly it or lie. I'm not going to, I'm not going to take things from a job posting. If I, I don't have any experience doing it, I'll go through it. What things line up to me, I'll take out and I'll put it in my resume and I'll, I'll give it a fair go. That's what we have to do. We have to have that ethical check. This system you can, you can use and manipulate, but we have to be honest with it. Okay. And let's get that out of the room now. And now we can move on to the other two phases. And the other two phases are the second one is the audience. And this is essentially looking at, let's say, the state of Arizona in this instance as a customer. And this kind of rests on the understanding of what to include and what not to include on the resume. The job posting is telling me everything I need to know. Also, the job posting is telling me, is this an entry, mid, or senior level position? That will also speak to the additional information I need to put on there to support what I've already mined out of the job posting and put in my resume. So we need to address that. So that's the audience looking at that and really thinking about that. Third is the layout. Noticing how the employer or the hiring manager structured the job posting. What types of skills really are they, are they highlighting first? What certification do they say first? And really it's, I'm putting that stuff left to right first on the resume as I'm targeting it to that job posting. And those are the three phases. Now let's look at what this looks like in a practical sense. Let's look back at that raw material. Here it is real quick with this graphic. So it's a little crazy with colors, but on the right-hand side, I've got all that raw material that I mined out of the job posting. On the top right, I've got a little legend and I've got it color-coded, yellow, green, and blue. Now yellow, I like to use for the skills section. The employment history section, which is not on this page, will be on the next one. The green, I like to use for the professional summary, and the blue, also not on this page, will be used for the employment history section. You can use whatever color you want, but this helps me color code it, figure out where everything is going. Here's how I like to do this. Once I have this information, I'm looking at, so for instance, look at the green highlighted material. A lot of that is longer phrased, those are sentences almost, longer phrased wording, we'll call it. I can't really put that in a key skill section because it's quick snippets. I could put it in an employment history section, but why not interweave it into the professional summary section? It really starts it off for us, folks, right here. Five or more years they're looking for, so let's give them that. Military veteran with five or more years. Again, it's on the ethical check that I have five or more years experience with this. Military veteran with five or more years proficiency in managing medium to large IT projects, developing software applications. Right there. Proven background in working collaboratively while building strong relationships inside and outside an organization and so forth. Skill with agile methodology, all from these green points. And it's all woven in here. Let's take a look at the key skills from the top here. Repeatable standards and practices project budget and resource allocation, theoretical and practical project management, et cetera. And I'm taking it out and I'm moving it strategically. Let's look at the next section of that resume. As we move down, we have the employment history now. So the blue right here, I'm putting into my last employment. Remember when I was talking about that chronological resume, when I was saying that it, it's, it's for stable work history, and, and usually recruiters want to see the job you're applying to somehow, more so than not, relates to the job you're leaving or had in the past, the, the most recent one. This is what I'm doing here, by, and I'm also tailoring it. Now, I was project manager at ABC Company, so I'm going to use a lot of the same verbiage if I've done a lot of the same things that they're asking for. I'm going to interweave that into my employment history. 
From that point, once I've got all that information in there, we'll go down to the next block of our employment history and we'll start um, making it more, uh, uh, what I'm trying to say, attractive as far as adding numbers and quantifying it, you know, those next bullets. And then we're putting certain things of our education and maybe adding a couple more skills that, co that correlate to the job we're applying for as well, just to add a little bit more flavor overall, a little bit more competitiveness for yourself. And that's essentially what we're doing. Looking at the job posting, looking at exactly what they're wanting. We're taking that, we're putting it in a digital notepad. Then we're asking ourselves a couple of questions. What kind of job is this? What do I need to include on here? Let's set it up. Let's get my basic resume, get it going. Then I'm gonna look at the formatting. How are they asking for certain information in that job posting? And I'm gonna start structuring things that way as well. And that's what we have to do every time. It comes from the basic resume, but we can, we can always implement from the job posting and then further take out or add what we want from there. We have to do this every time. And this is at the very end what it looks like, minus the heading and, and every other bit of information, but we've built a tailored resume. This is a chronological resume example. Remember, any format's gonna work so as long as we tailor that resume to the job posting. Remember that no two resumes are going to be the same. And I say this again because competition is inevitable. And I, I hate stoking the, the, the flames of fear, but it is what it is. And I, I'm always going to shoot you guys straight. It, it is a, it's, it's a tough market and we got to be competitive. How do we be competitive? We tailor our resumes and we add a lot more tangible results and evidence that speak more to what we have done in our past. That's how we get there. Okay, so we're doing really good on time because I want to spend a lot of time with ONET. I want to spend some time with LinkedIn, things like that. So we cruised through those uh, lessons, which was good. A lot of information. But again, we're going to sit down and have Zooms. After this, we'll get the links to you guys uh, to, for the calendar. You can go on there and schedule a time and a day that works for you. We'll sit down 30 minutes. You can have as many as you want and uh, we'll, we'll get something nailed out. We'll work together and get this going. So let's move into lesson four with that said. So here is some job searching in 2021, how things will be different and then how to adapt to some of these changes. So I put them right up here and this took a little bit, excuse me, a little bit of research to figure out because a lot of, a lot of different publications were saying that the, some different things. And these were the most common things that they were talking about. Number one is that historical hiring trends are probably not going to apply anymore. And what does that mean? So in years past, we've typically seen hiring surges at the start of a new year and then again in the fall, while the summer and holiday seasons have tended to usually be slower. But this is probably not going to be in the, the case in 2021, as we've kind of offset all that with certain things going on. We probably won't be able to depend on past hiring patterns across the board. Some industries that haven't been affected as much by the pandemic may still experience similar hiring trends as they have in previous years, but we should anticipate a downward trend at the start of the year right now for industries that struggle to adapt during the COVID-related restrictions. That's going to be some of the things that'll change. Reports indicate that hiring will pick up again in the second or third quarter of the year. Why am I telling you this? Just to give you all the information on what you should be looking at right now, what's happening in real time on the employment landscape. How are we gonna to adapt to all of these different changes? What we have to do is we gotta keep an eye on trends. So in a slower hiring market, the more you know about who is and who isn't hiring, the better. So to stay on top of what's happening, and hiring trends. Sign up for their newsletters if, you, if they have them. Follow companies you're interested on LinkedIn. That's where they put a lot of their communication, professionally speaking. Pay attention um, to the types of job postings you're seeing on job boards and the types of companies posting those. Go directly to their websites. If you aren't sure where to start, reach out to people in your network who also work in the space you're targeting. Ask them how they stay on top of industry trends. How are they keeping along with things changing right now? 
We got to adjust the job search accordingly. We may need to, need to consider even applying for positions we wouldn't have considered in the past. This could mean branching out to a new industry. That's fine. Taking on some freelance work, finding creative ways to update your skill set or trying out different job search strategies, I've seen proves to be worth it in the end. So we also want to stay in touch with our network. Right now, if you're transitioning out of the military, especially for you guys transitioning out of the military, take a nice snapshot of who's all around you, professionally speaking, colleague-wise, and, and make sure they're on LinkedIn. Get them on LinkedIn because when it comes time to have recommendations and have people vouch for you on your professional social media, social media website, they're going to be pivot, pivotal for that because they'll be able to write those recommendations. It's, we'll get more into LinkedIn uh, a little bit later in this course, but it's, it's, it's the new recommendation letter, LinkedIn is. People can leave feedback about you right on your profile, how great you were about something or how bad, maybe. So we got to make sure we surround ourselves with those colleagues to get that feedback because that just further enforces and helps point us and, and helps get, to, get us to where we're trying to go. So also some key industries are going to be booming. This year, tech, huge. 2020 was a big year for tech, largely because they don't rely on physical storefronts for business. A lot of people were using tech to buy things, which is, uh, which is also the, the, uh, the, the other industry that's booming, which is e-commerce, financial tech, healthcare and health tech, all of these customer service, renewable energy, all of these industries are deemed to be booming this year. So if we've got interest in these particular fields, start looking there because it's inevitable they're gonna be having some opportunities if they don't already. Temporary freelance contract work is going to be on the rise. So, and as we're already seeing, as I'm talking about people not being um, put or only relinquished to state lines, they, they can go anywhere now. You can work from New York and, and, and work in LA if you want uh, uh, on, the, on the internet remotely. And that's continuing to increase. During an uncertain economy, firms often rely more on temporary or project professionals. They may feel cautious about hiring, but at the same time, they don't wanna be um, understaffed and they have, they have work that must, must get done. So they have to do something. So a lot of this work will be coming. Remote work is here to stay uh, as well as the trends are saying, and some things to adapt with that. Let's broaden our searches. The remote work trend has opened up so many possibilities for people all over the country. This means that not only can you apply to the usual jobs in your area, but you can also apply for jobs that might be a base, based across the country. I've been saying that the whole time. It's so much more uh, options, but with that comes more competitiveness because more people are doing it. Also, very, very important right now, we got to keep our video interviewing skills sharp. With so many companies continuing to embrace that remote work, it stands the reason that interviews will continue to be largely remote too. So even those that will eventually expect employees to come into the office, <clears throat> hiring is still going to be remotely interviewing done through video means. So be ready to answer common interview questions and follow up with those uh, video tips. And I'll have some of those as we get into the interview section. Um, also, companies will expand their focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Though also recruiting will continue to become more automated. As more people continue to look for work and as competition rises, automation, we need to utilize automation to sift through all that. So how are we going to adapt? As we've been talking about this whole time, we're going to tailor our resume. That's one point. And then we're going to get into some other things that really help with that. So let's get into some job searching facts or stats first. So right now, an online job ad receives about 250 resumes on average. And from these 250 applications, only about 2% receive interviews. So, and like I said earlier, 98% of Fortune 500 companies use applicant tracking systems. One study found as many as 50% of jobs are filled internally before even making it to the public eye. Now, these are due to legal. Uh, they're, they're, they're given out there due to fulfill legal requirements but they're already fulfilled. According to Career Pivot, referrals, network, having somebody, a professional contact, 50% of jobs are filled internally before even making it to the public eye. According to Career Pivot, 
referrals have a 50% shot of getting an interview, whereas for non-referrals, that drops to about 3%. In fact, Jobvite shares that 40% of hires come from the referral pool, which is basically only 7% of all applications. 40% of all hires come from 7% of people applying. And that's because they had a referral. Somebody in a network somewhere. Now, how are we gonna get those somebodies is the question I'm gonna show you. Now, let's talk about Indeed and LinkedIn. Now, in 2019 alone, Indeed delivered 70% of all hires in the United States. That's insane. In 2019, 75% of people who went through a career change used LinkedIn. Now, as of 2020, uh, there's going to be different sites to help us navigate where we want to go. So for instance, let's say I'm an executive type and I want to, I need to apply to executive type roles. I would go to a place like ladders.com, L-A-D-D-E-R-S.com. It's best for executives. Let's say I'm looking for tech jobs. I would go to dice, D-I-C-E.com. It's best for tech jobs. If I'm solely looking for remote jobs, go to flexjobs.com. They all partner with Indeed and LinkedIn and take from their certain resources, uh, job postings and such, but they're more catered towards specific things that we're looking for. It's, it's, it'll definitely help narrow down what and help kind of narrow what we're looking for. So a couple of job searching 101s that I like to have is number one, I like to break it down. And this is how I like to do it, is having a goal to get a new job or start a new position, even after leaving service, can be, can be looked at as being no different than saying you want to get in shape or save money. They're just goals. We stated the end result. The question is how we're going to get there. So I like to break down the job search into easier, more manageable goals. I like to strategize by asking myself questions. Do I want to find three companies to target this week? Do I want to apply to three to five positions? you know, a day or both. The intention is essentially to keep me focused on narrow goals so I don't get bogged down with overhauling my entire professional life. You know, and number two is figuring out which sites are best to apply through. Indeed, LinkedIn, some of the top. And then if you want to go into the niche areas like Dice for tech jobs or Flex jobs for remote or Ladders for executives, something like that, that's fine too. Expanding that is great, but figuring out where we need to go is, for, is first. We need to figure out which job postings, which job searching sites are best for us. The top two, Indeed and LinkedIn. You can't go wrong with those. Also, we want to ensure that the resume, and we talked about this in the bulk of the class already, is that it's optimized for applicant tracking system by way of being tailored to the job posting. Also, and very, very important is we want to make sure our LinkedIn is optimized for the industry we're wanting to get into. I was just talking to somebody today about LinkedIn and, and how, you know, didn't really know what particular job he wanted, but he knew the industry he wanted to get into. So my advice is this, for LinkedIn, if, if you know generally where you want to go industry-wise, you want to get into tech, you, you want to, you, maybe you want to work for the Raytheons, the Boeings of the world, or just depending on where you want to go, Let's optimize that LinkedIn for that. What does that mean? So start, start following companies in that particular industry. Start talking about things on your LinkedIn and your about section and in your headline that speaks to that industry. We'll look into that. So let's look at real quick. I'm going to hop over here. Uh, before we get into LinkedIn, LinkedIn is I want to show you guys own it. If you haven't seen it already, I'll show you some things that are kind of incredible about it. So when starting a job search, before, before, you know, as we're doing the resume, as we're looking at job postings, we really want to figure out, you know, if, we're, if, if we want some more information about particular job titles, positions, we go to ONET. We go to ONET because it's such a fountain of knowledge. And like I said, some of you may know about it, but I'll show you a few, a few things that you may have not seen before. All right. So let's say we are applying for management analyst type roles. Okay. Let's put this up here put it in the search bar. And what it's going to do is it's going to spit out some results. Management analyst being at the top. We're going to click that. This is why I like LinkedIn, ONET so much, because up here, it gives a quick synopsis. This helps, let's say we don't have a basic resume really uh, right now. 
We were a management analyst type. We've done that in the military. We're, I'm trying to create a resume. I don't really know what I'm doing. I can go to own it. I can type in management analyst and it'll give me kind of a quick synopsis of what a management analyst is and does. I can use that, you know, essentially as a professional summary to start out. Also note right here, guys, sample of reported job titles. These are other job titles that are being used out there that are falling under the same thing, management analyst. It kind of broadens your search a little bit. Also, going back to, let's say someone who doesn't know how to build a resume, that don't, doesn't really have a basic resume, but has some experience you know, as a management analyst in the military or before, and, and is trying to formulate that work history aspect of the resume. You've already got the professional summary with that top part up here, but this right here in the tasks where I just dropped this down, this is a great starting point for building that employment history block for being a management analyst at X company. It, it's basically those bullet points. As we're going down here, notice we've got technology, but something very interesting, knowledge, skills, and abilities. Here's something I'm finding. Employers are going to own it and they're creating job postings based off a lot of the information that ONET is telling them for their KSAs or their knowledge, skills, and abilities in these sections. So if I'm an employer and I'm building a management analyst um, job posting, I'm going to come here. I'm going to take for my knowledge and skills and abilities. I want to have things from the company that I need Then I'm going to come here and I'm going to ask for these things as well. And that's what they're doing. So if you're coming here and looking at the language and they're coming here, we're speaking the same language from the get-go, which is great. Going down as we work down a little bit. We got some education. It tells you, you know, predominantly what type of level of education this field holds. Also, very important, credentialing, fine training, certifications, licenses, apprenticeships, right here. But most importantly, and, and this cannot be, uh, you know, taken lightly, it's, I get this question all the time, and the answer is right here on ONET. How much do I ask for in an interview if they ask me? on the video call, if they ask me, on the, on the phone, if they ask me, what do I say? Right here, it's telling you, um, in the United States, medium wages as of 2019 is $41 an hour for management analysts. Let's get to Arizona. Let's see what we're looking at. Because it's gonna be a little bit different. Now, in Arizona, it's a little bit low, but again, the United States, taking in consideration different costs of living in every, you know, in California specifically in New York, they kind of off, you know, offshoot that a little bit, but Arizona is not bad. You can even go down to hourly. It gives you an hourly wage. You can scroll down a little bit and it'll show you the different cities where it's being paid. Now here's where it comes in to the negotiation when you're talking in the interview. If I have, let's take the resume example, five or more years experience, as a, let's say a management analyst now. And the median salary in Arizona is 36.90 and the highest 64.10. I gotta figure out somewhere in there where I wanna ask. I'll maybe take an average of the both and scale it a little bit in the North and shoot for that. But I'm gonna justify that because I came to own it. I'll tell them this is based off of, you know, the wages in this geographical area or something like that a little bit better. But you get, get what I'm saying. So secondly, over on ONET, that's very, very important, but also has its limits, is using this crosswalk search. You could come up here if you're, you know, if even if you're transitioning out of the military or if you've been in the military recently and, and want to see, you know, some jobs are related to your particular MOS. That's its limitation. It will show you things based off the MOS you have. You could also go here, though, and look at other jobs related to other MOSs if you wanted to get other ideas. But let's say Army, uh, easiest one to do, I remember, would be 11 Bravo. And this will shoot out types of uh, jobs that are um, related to that particular MOS code. You can do it, and it's all going to be related to that. And we can work that way, too, if we want to stick with the type of position we have in the military as we're getting out. Or if we got out and we really liked what we did and we want to continue with that, we can do this. Let's jump over to LinkedIn real quick. Um, and I'm gonna show you mine because uh, I'm just gonna show you some things that I do online. And uh, 
to hopefully give you guys kind of an overview about what I do. So on mine, this is Dan. Um, I've got a background picture. You have to have background pictures now, and I have a headshot. And that's really it. Now, if we're and this is all all optimized for my industry. How do you, how do you say, it, Dan? Well, because I work in in a, in a circle where I work with people, you know, for a living, and I you know we have Zooms with them, and I want to I want to present myself, you know, with a nice photo, but also like a nice calm background for my for my LinkedIn. I'm, I'm working with military families and all that stuff, so I want I want it to look nice, and that's why I have it optimized for that. I also put military family employment consultant right after my name. That's a key thing. Why do I do that? Because in my industry, employment specialists or career specialists or career coaches or whatever you want to call them, my industry speaks that type of verbiage, military family employment consultant. And what that means is, and we'll get into it when we jump back into the, to the uh, career readiness training, is when employers are looking for people on LinkedIn to ask them to apply to their work because they're doing that. It's called candidate sourcing. Um, I'll come up if they're looking for people who are military family employment consultants, which seems to be the most used jargon in that industry. And that's what I'm using. I also have a tagline here, nationally recognized employment educator and trainer, serving those who have served. If we have, let's say IT, if we have financial a background, whatever, this type of format works for whatever. This is a blueprint. And I wanted to show you, just kind of get your guys' minds working in this direction. LinkedIn is a marketing tool for, for me, for you, for everybody. Like it or not, we're selling ourselves on here for jobs. And we're, we're, we're selling ourselves for Pacific, specific industries, not Pacific, specific industries. I always do that. Also going down here in my about section, this section right here, this can be a little bit more loose than the resume. We can talk about things in here that we're proud of. So I talked about the career readiness training. I'm proud of that. Doing this with you guys. I put that on LinkedIn. I talk about the different agencies, government colleges, nonprofits I've worked with. I, I talk about a little bit of who I am in there. We can do that. Recruiters want to know. As we're going down, it shows the activity, my experience, education, skills. Here it is right here. Recommendations. I was talking about this earlier. Your colleagues can go and give you recommendations on your LinkedIn. I would start asking people for them if you're getting out of service, if you're getting back into the job searching of the employment landscape. It's very, very good. Um, also skills, et cetera, accomplishments, and then interests. Now on here, I show this because a lot of this stuff, I don't know who these people are. And you're probably like, well, then why are you following them? Because... I don't want a recruiter or an employer to look at me and be able to figure out like where my political interests lie, where my religious interests lie, where anything that would that 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 can you know be a red flag to somebody or offend somebody, I don't want them to know. So I follow every different thing all over the spectrum. I'm a I'm a chameleon on LinkedIn. Now you can say, well, you work with military, so you kind of pigeonhole yourself there. That's true. I did that deliberately, but I'm in that sec sector. There's still a lot of people in there with varying opinions and uh, uh, ideologies. So I want to make sure I don't, I don't pigeonhole myself in a corner. And I recommend you guys do the same thing by diversifying what you follow, what you comment on, what you like, things like that. You never know who's going to be a red flag to somebody or it's going to pop somebody off. You never know. So, okay. With that said, let's get back into this real quick. And I was talking about candidate sourcing and I was on LinkedIn and I was telling you, you know, it says my name, Dan LaBarbera, comma, military family employment consultant. And this goes right into how employers are finding us. They're doing something called candidate sourcing. So in addition to reviewing resumes posted to their company websites and to job sites like Indeed and LinkedIn, employers are actively sourcing passive, can passive candidates. So they're, they're mining the internet to find the best people to hire regardless of whether or not we've expressed interest in the company. And besides uh, spending time personally searching the internet for candidates for employment, companies are using technology that will help them find the applicants for them. That's the candidate sourcing part, candidate sourcing programs. And that's why I have that employment family you know, uh, uh, consultant on there, military family employment consultant, because that's the language being spoken in my arena, so to speak. And when recruiters are posting jobs, I'll pop up, I'm not looking for anything, but 
all pop up nonetheless. And I, and that's kind of, that goes to something I learned a long time ago about passive income. This is passive opportunities. If you, if you optimize your LinkedIn, you'll have opportunities coming into your inbox. People will be asking, hey, are you interested in this? Hey, are you interested in that? Some of you might already be having that happening just depending on how your LinkedIn looks already. So it's very, very important. Now, again, I touched on this real briefly. LinkedIn is the equivalent to our professional brand. We're selling ourselves professionally out there. Having a background image in a headshot is paramount. Have to have a nice professional one. Having a LinkedIn headline. Here's an example. Finance manager at company X. Financial, financial planning and analysis. Saving organizations millions. That's a quick little headline you can have on a LinkedIn and a financial um, background. You can do that type of format anywhere with any type of industry. But the fact of the matter is, even though it may be cheesy, it's the game we have to play. Now, again, I talked about this too, the about section. Job seekers need to be giving this section more attention as well. It's, it's a very good idea, including more content that tells a story, which includes statements of, their, of, of your greatness, basically. Think about the passion you have for what you do and how well you do it. Share quantified accomplishments that prove that value as well. So an example, you can say something like this. You know, one of my greatest accomplishments was initiating and implementing X before the deadline of X, a customer relations management system that increased productivity by X, X percent. It's almost like taking a bullet from your employment history and putting it on there, except you can make it a little bit more human friendly instead of applicant tracking friendly. You know what I mean? Um, better content that's going to brand us should continue throughout our LinkedIn profile. In the education, we can tell a story. Don't skip adding you know, volunteer experience. Companies appreciate those who volunteer. Think branding. Okay. With that being said, as we're thinking professional branding, let's talk about career networking. What is it and what are the facts? 70% of professionals get hired at companies where they have a personal connection. This type of networking or this type of networking that, we're, that, that happens, LinkedIn provides and can be invaluable for making it to the top of the interview list. Having somebody you reach out to on LinkedIn, setting up an informational interview, and we'll talk about that in a second. And, and getting them, letting them know, you know, maybe you applied after a few exchanges of, of conversations or whatnot, letting them know you applied. That's what it's designed for. And then they, they can vouch for you. The company can go to your LinkedIn and see. And it helps, especially if it's people we've worked with in the past, obviously, colleagues that can advocate for us. 80% of jobs are never posted or only found through networking. That's another crazy thing. Only 7% of job applicants get an employee referral, yet account for 40% of all hires. We talked about that. I just wanted to reiterate that one more time. 40% of all hires are being picked from a pool that's 7% of all applications. Recruiters spend, on average, six seconds looking at the resume. So the translation of that meaning, a resume alone won't get you a job, but a bad one can ruin your chances. A typical corporate job posting is going to attract 250 resumes on average. We're seeing more now. So we have to do more when it comes to standing out with the other 249 that apply. On average, it takes about 52 days to fill a job right now. In other words, it's not going to be a fast process. And here, right here, um, is the thing that really blew my mind. 76% of resumes are thrown out due to unprofessional email addresses. Now, we can pose the question, what's an unprofessional email address. Some of us might immediately go to extreme unprofessional email addresses, but it could be as simple as danjohnlab3679 at gmail.com. That did it. Don't know why, but it does it. They want to see first name, last name, gmail.com or yahoo, or whatever you want to use. First name, dot middle name, or dot to middle initial, dot last name, at so it's, they want to know who they're talking to, not a character. And that's really why they're getting thrown out. And that's the hard truth of what the feedback I'm getting. So talking about career networking and knowing some of those hard facts that will get us kicked right out the door, what do we got to do in terms of career networking? Well, number one is we want to work on a 30-second elevator pitch. 
what is this? Having a 30 second elevator pitch is basically a 30 or 60 second summary of who you are, what you do, and why you're the perfect candidate. Where it gets its name is basically comes from if you were to walk in an elevator and meet the hiring person for the position you want, and you had that brief elevator ride with them, what could you convey to them to convince them to hire you? Right there on that ride, it's the elevator pitch. It's what people use to get signed to um, TV scripts, things like that. That's why it's called that. Also, send out job networking letters. Here's a special note here. A networking letter is not a letter we use to ask for a job. A networking letter is basically a letter we send out to friends, friends of friends and professional contacts. And we ask them for career advice, introductions, or even job leads. Anything and everything that's gonna help us. Also, right now, as a lot of us are online, you, we can't go out and really mingle a lot, just kind of depending on where you are, but you, you really can't. Join professional organizations online. A lot of them are meeting online. A lot of them are talking through Zoom. And a lot of people are networking through Zoom and getting um, contacts that way. So joining those prof professional organizations, you never know who knows who or what opportunity could be behind whoever you meet. I mean, it's just so much ambiguity out there. So we got to make sure we do that. Um, also updating our network frequently and staying in touch. I do it with my LinkedIn where I'll go and I'll send certain emails to certain people. I'm being very selective with this and I'm being very honest because you never know when you might need somebody as far as a leverage in the employment game. LinkedIn is made for that. It's not Facebook and it's not Instagram. I don't need to be seeing photos of everything. It's, hey, how you doing? Hope your professional you know, goals are going well. I just wanted to check in, blah, 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 blah. Oh, hey, Dan, how you doing? That's it, really. But it's something happens. I can always make sure that they're there and they're aware and things like that. It, it's, 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 it's a selfish pursuit, but it has to be because it's, it's us securing employment at the end of the day. Now, when we send out job networking letters, and let's say we get some leads and we get some introductions to people, here's what we're going to want to do. Unlike a, on, on a formal interview, we're going to want to conduct with them informational interviews, where essentially the goal is to is not ne necessarily to secure a job at the end of the conversation. It, it's, it's actually to, to learn about who they are, what industry they're in, what got them there, and what advice and or, or, or tips, information they can give you to help get you there. Um, reaching out to them, letting them know what you're doing and why you're interested is, is excellent. And oftentimes people will be willing to talk to you about their careers if they feel you're genuine and you're, you're interested in advice and suggestions. You're not just looking for, for a job. The, the slow burn will pay off in this aspect a lot more, I promise. And if you don't know as far as what professional organization to join or what's happening as far as networking online is going, one of my favorite sites to go to is Eventbrite. And you can go to Eventbrite and you can go into a little search and you can put um, Maricopa County, if you're going to Maricopa County, Arizona, Yavapai County, Pima County, Arizona, and put in business networking and it'll pull up everything that's going on and you can sign up and it's free. Okay, let's move in real quick to some interviews and then we'll open it up to some questions and we can talk a little bit. Firstly, the video Zoom interview is here to stay. However, the concepts and foundation you lay prior, during, and after the interview is going to remain the same. So even with the Zoom video interview, we have to research the company. I've sat on hiring boards where the person I'm interviewing has no idea the company I'm working for. And it's really frustrating. It's, it's, a, it's a put off. It's not good. And they've lost the opportunity at that point because it shows me they can't at least do enough um, digging or research to know about what they're interviewing for. I don't want to hire that type of person. So research that company. Also, rereading the job description. A lot of the interview questions, especially video-based, if, if we're going that route, video-based interviews are going to be crafted around the job posting and what they're looking for. So having that around, having that reread and understood is very, very good. Be prepared with examples of work. Um, what do I mean by this? So let's say we go into an interview. Uh, let's say it's face-to-face. -face. You're wearing masks, sure, face-to-face. Um, -face. They'll say, if I can't plug this at any point of the interview, I'll wait till the end where they say, hey, do you have anything left for us? Any questions? And I'll say, as a matter of fact, I do. 
I wanted to elaborate or reinforce why I'm the best candidate for this role, and here is why. And I'll go down the examples of my work. How do you do that on a vid video? If there or a phone, you can do that over the phone if you have it in front of you. Over the video, if it's face to face, we can do it that way as well. Having that ready is paramount. At the very end, that's the crusher that'll do it. If you can pepper it in for your answers, depending on what they're asking, that's also great too. Also, don't over uh, don't overthink this, but or plan the interview attire the night before. It seems like if we're going to do a video interview, it would just be easy to wake up and put it on and whatnot, but it's not. It's I've tried that. Don't do it. Plan the interview attire the night before. Also, if we're going to be in person, let's plan the schedule. Plan to arrive 10 to 15 minutes early. Practice good manners and body language. Listen, I don't want to have to be saying all this stuff, but this is stuff that I see more often than not that is not being practiced out there. All of this that I'm giving you, good manners and body language, that sells more than the words coming out of my mouth sometimes. I'm sure you can attest to it. Practice your answers to common interview questions. What I would do is like right now, for instance, um, for if, if I was in your shoes and I was looking for a job, I would go to Google and say, top interview questions 2021 right now. Print them out. I look at them. Maybe I'll write my answers. Maybe I'll fill in my answers online. I'll look at them. I won't necessarily memorize them, but I'll remember the, the content, so to speak, in it so I can answer in a video interview the common questions just right off the bat. Not canned, but having a general idea of what I'm going to say is awesome to have in your back pocket. Also understanding the STAR method. This is what all behavioral interview questions are about. STAR method, situation, the task, the action, and the result. That's what they're looking for. And that's how we need to answer every behavioral question in that format. Tell me one of your greatest uh, times where you had to do, or tell me one of the times you had to deal with a coworker who was, who was uh, you know, fighting with another coworker, however they do the interview questions or anything like that. We're gonna wanna address it. We're gonna want to, what happened, the action we took and the result. Always positive. Now, we can also recruit a friend to practice uh, questions with or a spouse. And then lastly, salary. I showed you on own it because I find that to be very, very, very important. Knowing that salary, knowing what you're worth. Did you know, veterans, we are historically underemployed and underpaid. And I'm not saying that because I want to wave a flag. I'm just saying that because it's a fact. And we do it to ourselves a lot of the time because we don't know. We don't know how to where to look. We get out of service and we're, oh, this guy's going to give me a job? Awesome. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do it. Yeah, that's how I was, at least. I know that's how a lot of my buddies were. And knowing our worth when we get out is paramount. Okay? Here's some tips during the Got to have copies of our resume, even if it's, if it's video. They're going to ask questions about it. It happens all the time. Always treat people with respect. There was an instance where somebody literally walked in the front desk. This is pre-COVID. Um, walked in the front desk, super rude to the front lady. Front lady, knew the hiring manager. One word, lost, lost the chance right then and there just because of the demeanor and the way the person was talking. Treat everybody. You never know the connection they have with the company or who, who is there at the company who they have connections with. Also, win them over with authenticity and positivity. Respond truthfully to questions when asked. I don't lie. So if I don't know something, I'm going to tell you I don't know. I'm going to get back to you. Not necessarily in the interview, but right now if you ask me. Anytime, I'm always going to be honest. In an, in an interview, if I don't know something, I'm going to try to answer it in a way to try to bring it back out positive. I may not know this, but I do know this, which is very similar to X, what you just asked me. Something like that. Always tie answers back to your skills and accomplishment and never speak negatively about past employers. Interviews are also not a time to speak about combat zones or anything like that. I, I hate to say that, but I've sat in them before and look, folks, it's just, it's not a time for it. And we got to understand that. And it's happened before. So a couple of things after the interview that are paramount, that really secure, really, really secure it for you at the end of the day is. When they ask you, ask about, uh, and they ask you, you have any other questions, anything for us, ask about next steps and plug your examples of work if you haven't already. At the very end, also send personal thank you letters to the interviewer if you can, or the recruiting manager. 
This is very effective and it's effective only if you do it this way. During the interview, they're gonna be asking, excuse me, you questions, whether it's in person, whether it's video. If you have a moment with that interviewer where it's, you know, you get them to laugh or they, or they, they kind of go off trail a little bit and you guys start talking about something else. I know it's happened before to at least some of us. Take that, take that when you're writing your, your thank you letter, take that memory, put that in there, reinforce who you are, let them remind them who you are. And that stands out. That stands out a lot. Oh yeah, that person was great. I really liked interviewing them. That's the end of the final lesson. Look, it's a lot of information. I understand. Searching for a career is a very, can be a very frustrating process. How could someone write about themselves for a resume cover letter? Effectively search for work through hundreds of platforms, network virtually and in person, creating an effective and attractive LinkedIn, and know the ins and outs of an interview. How is somebody supposed to know all of that? The thing is, is you're not. And you have people here that are, that are supposed to help you. And this helped alleviate some employment stress. Remember, we got to dedicate time to this. There's, there's going to be no shortcuts. We tailor the resume or not. That's it. Because competition is inevitable. So preparation, tact is key.